a scientist, a policymaker, a champion for knowledge. Our guest today is internationally celebrated scientist, Dr. Tanvir Nain. You have paved the way for strategic development in the field of science and technology, research and development, and innovation in Pakistan. You've been listed as one of the 500 most influential Muslims in the world, and also been nominated for the Pakistan Power 100. Welcome to our show, Dr. Tanvir Nain. Thank you, Fadia. Thank you for having me here. <laughs> no, it's Thank a pleasure. So, Dr. Nain, you're quite a celebrated figure in the field of science and technology in Pakistan and in the field of innovation. Where does the passion for science come from? I think, um, well, if it was me, I think everyone would be a scientist. <laughs> I think we are all born scientists because science tells you to look for truth. Hmm. And we all should be looking for truth. Hmm. And uh, to me, I think every human being in a way is a scientist because hmm. they all look for truth. You completed your PhD from uh, the University of Sussex and um, back in the 70s. Your parents must have been really liberal to have sent you all the way to the UK for your education. Yes, I, I think my father was very, very liberal. He sent all my sisters abroad. All, my three sisters are doctors, medical doctors. Hmm. And I came and did uh, a PhD in chemistry. Yeah. So you wouldn't be sitting here if it wasn't for the support of your parents? No, no certainly not. not certainly. Now, you had a very close bond uh, with your father. Did he always encourage you to, full, uh, to fulfill your dreams? He did, he did, yeah. I, at one point, I wanted to be an artist. Hmm. So I took up art and uh, I did some courses hmm. to become an artist. And he encouraged me to do that. So whatever I wanted to do, he, he encouraged us to do that. But you had quite, a, uh, uh, you had, you, you, you had quite an interesting uh, school and college life also, didn't you? Yes. You were involved in a lot of activities. Yes. Uh, some of them were not scientific activities. <laughs> Tell us a little about that. <laughs> yeah, I did, I did poetry also. Yes. <laughs> yes, I, I did write poetry for some time. Yeah. Yes, and I loved uh, going into the poetry class, you know, the Urdu class. Yeah. Because I was doing science, we were not reading Urdu literature. Hmm. Um, but I, I, uh, I would miss my science class and go to the, um, the class of uh, Haseen Bibi was the teacher's name. Yeah. And she was a very good, I think she was an excellent Urdu poetry teacher. So, yeah. so she taught, taught, me, taught, taught me how to write poetry. poetry. So if you were not a scientist, is it fair to say that you would be a poet? I, I think I would be a scientist. Okay. So you're <laughs> a scientist. I, I would. I would. I. I always felt that you could do everything, and mm. I think you could combine. Poetry goes very well with science, I think, because uh, you know nature is all about. Um, you know, it, nat nature is art. Hmm. So you you married a career diplomat, and as a result, your career suffered many breaks because you were posted overseas. Yes. Do you feel that um, that hindered the contributions that you could have made towards progress in Pakistan? I think it was a learning experience, you know, uh, also to be exposed to different cultures and uh, different type of people yeah. and um, to have a, so it has, uh, it, yes, it, it probably, you know, it, it kept my, me away from science yeah. for some time. Um, but in Australia, I was teaching at the university, and I tried to do some kind of science everywhere. Hmm. And when we were posted to London, I did um, keep in touch with the Imperial College, made several visits to the hmm. library, and kept writing my but si your science papers. But career came first. Yes, but his, came, his career did come first <laughs> at that time, yes. And yes. now? Now my career. Your, has now come your career. On. My so the career time has changed. Back. Time has changed. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Now you um, have promoted a research culture in Pakistan. Why do you feel research is so important? I think research is uh, research is about find, all about science is all about researching, mm -hmm. and um, when. In 1999, when we started this reform program, yeah. 
I realized that the Pakistani universities were only producing 600 or publishing only 600 international papers in the, mm. uh, and this, this was just too little. Mm. And I, I, I felt that the university teaching could not have been of very high quality without mm. research. I tried to promote that through a, by, through a program which I called the Research Productivity Program. Mm. So the, the funding was provided by General Musharraf because we gave a presentation to him and I mm. asked him um, to, for funding. And so scientists were provided incentives mm. to carry out high quality research and to supervise uh, students. And we, I also felt that the, the research that we were, the little research that mm. we were doing was not relevant to Pakistan. Hmm. that it did not solve our problems. So we decided we would promote um, research within Pakistan. Hmm. So as a result, we have now 12,000 students enrolled in the um, MPhil, which is hmm. Master of Philosophy hmm. and PhD programs. And uh, I'm happy to report that 70% are women. Now you helped increase the GDP share for scientific research in Pakistan from 0.4% in 1999 to 0.67% in 2012. Why has Pakistan appointed such a low budget for science and research? Is it because defense will always be our number one priority? Yes, unfortunately, you know, during the 60s, yeah. we had um, the, we, we had a better budget for science towards the civilian sectors. But after um, India exploded, you know, or tested the atomic device, and after Bangladesh separated, yeah. the priorities changed. The research priorities changed. And it was felt that, uh, you know, Pakistan could have, you know, could probably, if Pakistan did not have a credible defense system, then maybe it would disintegrate. So at that time, the, Mr. Bhutto decided to go for nuclear uh, research and you know, for, for atomic bomb. So the, most of the budget, I think about seven, 60 to 70% at that time went towards uh, defense research. But it's Civilian strange research that suffered um, as even, a though, even though uh, in the 60s, a, a large chunk of our budget was um, went towards military and defense, but it took a man from military, General Parvez Musharraf, to actually increase the scientific uh, and uh, scientific budget, science and technology, sorry, budget, six folds during his um, regime. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It, no, during the sixties, the budget went towards the civilian. And most most of the budget went towards agricultural research. Hmm. Um, as a result of that research budget, which was not very high, you know, as compared to the Western countries, but it was high enough to bring about a green revolution in Pakistan. So do you feel, though Musharraf was a military man, do you feel that he had a better vision and do you feel the future of Pakistan would have been in more capable hands had he still been in power? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> there was a long gap there. <laughs> yes, I think so. I think so. I, I, I really think I, I, he was very democratic in his ways. He may have been, um, you know, um, trained in the military, mm. but uh, he was very democratic and he understood what whenever we made a presentations to him about science and technology or about mm. um, social research even, he was very supportive. Yeah. He was very supportive, indeed, yes. For higher, you know, I made a presentation to him about, um, the first was about um, bringing in a new science policy and you know, what we all wanted to do in science and technology and how we wanted to shift from um, an agriculture-based or resource-based economy to, to a knowledge-based knowledge -based economy. Yeah. He absolutely took in every word that uh, we had said and uh, was very supportive. You've written several papers, published several papers. You've um, edited 16 books and written two books. Mm -hmm. You're a big champion 
for a knowledge-based economy. However, Pakistan's literacy rate is one of the lowest in the world. Do you feel, Dr. Naim, that perhaps science, innovation, and technology is a bit far-fetched for a country where the majority of the population is illiterate? Yes. Uh, in a way, you're right that, you know, we all need, we may, we have to make them all literate. Yeah. And uh, for equity-based development to take place, hmm. it's important that we address literacy at all level. Hmm. And uh, I have also been writing about, uh, in all my papers, in hmm. fact, I have been writing about quality education for all. So it's not just, hmm. uh, but the mandate that we were given was to promote higher education. Hmm. And uh, you do need uh, to promote higher education because you need teachers also. You have to move towards knowledge-based economy if you have to survive in this globalized world. But Dr. Naim, why is the Pakistani government not yeah. making education, or at least primary and secondary education, a compulsion in Pakistan? I think the, uh, they, they, most people, I mean, there would be a, it would be uh, naive, perhaps, to think that they probably don't realize it. But they don't seem to have the budget for it. And one of the reasons is they have to cut down on... There, there are too many competing priorities. And although education should be the most important mm. area, education and health, in my mm. opinion, should be... should have the priority... The Fighting terrorism is perhaps another priority. Yeah. And the defense budget, although Musharraf was trying to cut it down and, and bring uh, and divert some of that budget towards education, yeah. um, unfortunately, you know, the war on terror uh, then pushed us. We've gone back to perhaps yeah. uh, increasing our defense budget. Dr. Naeem, it's time for a break. We'll see you shortly. Welcome back. Let's continue our chat with Dr. Tanveer Naim. Now, you worked tirelessly in promoting higher education in Pakistan and were also responsible in sending, sending students to Korea and for scientific collaboration between Pakistan and China. Why did the government of Pakistan withdraw funding for PhD students that were sent from Pakistan to various universities overseas? And there were 4,000, roughly over 4,000 students that were sent. Midway, midway, their funding was withdrawn. Yeah, Why is I that? I think this was, this was uh, when the government changed. And uh, suddenly, um, they decided... You mean when Zardari's government came? Yes. Mm. When, the, and when there, this government came, they decided to... Uh, this was a temporary phase, though. They yeah. decided to cut down. There was an immediate... You know, there was a problem because I think there, there was a huge debt mm. crisis and they, the government had to pay off a lot of debt and the higher education budget, which had been increased to 28 billion rupees, mm. was a huge amount, and they thought they could not continue giving that mm. money, and they stopped it. But this is a, this uh, prompted the resignation of Dr. Atau Rahman. Uh, he resigned because he felt that the students would be all let down, you know, and this was a big These were not five program. students. They were over 4,000 students. Oh, 4, they students. were midway through their PhD. What message is the government sending the international community? Yeah, that, that's, that's why then we all campaigned for it. And they, they restored it. I think it was restored after about three months. Isn't it strange, Dr. Naim, that even though the current government, the Zardari government, um, took away budgets from higher education, yet on his recent trip to India, he donated one million US dollars to Ajmer Sharif? Yeah. <laughs> I, I would never understand such decisions. I, I don't. I, if it was up to me, I would convert 
all shrines of pa in Pakistan into universities. So it must be frustrating for you to be working for science, towards science and technology and innovation while the system is constantly working against you. Yeah, but I, I must say that I, you know, I found it easy to work in Pakistan. I've worked all over the world. Mm. <laughs> you know, you know that I started from England and, and I was in Germany and, and mm. in Australia. And so wherever I was, although I, uh, I did work, I was uh, in Germany too. I was at Bonn and Bochum universities. And uh, I found it easy um, to work and uh, to, to bring about some changes. Mm. And it, it's always nice to be able to change something. Mm. And if you can change something, um, even if it's little, mm. it has uh, some impact. You, you feel that you've done your bit, mm. or you've contributed something mm. for the betterment of a society of people. And that mattered to me a lot. Now, while teaching at Khaled Azam University in Islamabad, back in the 70s. Yes. Uh, the university told you to stop wearing trousers to work. Hi. And you point blank refused. Yes. Did you not worry you might lose your job? Uh, no, not for a second. Um, you know, the... Why did you insist I, on wearing... I'm, I'm, I mean, that was, a, that was a bold move. No, it wasn't. In those days, a lot of, you know, this was the beginning of Ziaul Haq period. I think Pakistan changed a lot during Ziaul Haq period. Mm. A lot of these fundamentalist uh, and false mm. values mm. started coming in during his time. Mm. But I, uh, you know, the vice chancellor asked me that the students had complained about my dress. Mm. So I went to the classroom and I said, those of you who, who object to my dress should have the courage to walk out in front of me. <laughs> uh, from my class, they didn't, none of them did. And I said, look, I'm not going to change my dress because you don't like it. Mm -hmm. I want you to listen to me and to, mm. to understand my lectures. I don't want you to look at me, mm. uh, you know, and my dress. So I think uh, it's, uh, I never changed, I didn't change. Uh, a feisty one, hmm? um, I said you were a feisty one. I believe you went to Nigeria to deliver a presentation on science, on science policy. And uh, you, refuse, you refuse to leave the country till you didn't see the president. Is that true? Yes. <laughs> I was a member of an international advisory board which UNESCO had set up to mm. advise on science policy uh, to Nigeria. And we were invited but then told by the ministry mm. that the president would not be able to see us. Mm. So um, I was accompanied by uh, Joe Ritson, who is a uh, former Minister for Science and Technology from Netherlands, mm. and uh, Eddie Patterson, who was advisor on science to the South African government. The three of us had gone there. And then we were told, you can't see the president. So I said, well, if we don't see the president tomorrow, then I don't know about my colleagues, but I will not return. <laughs> and so they made us see the president. Yeah. And uh, they first told us that he would only see us for 15 minutes. Hmm. But he did see us for, uh, I think, about four or five hours. And we did manage to uh, send our message, you know, to, to convince oh. him that he should spend at least five billion dollars and scientific research. Now you went to work the day your son got married. Yes, that but... kind of dedication is unheard of. What drives you, Dr. Naim? Now, I think that was the time <laughs> when I was trying to change, change, uh, you know, bring about a change. And every minute seemed to matter. Yes. You know, I thought we had little time Mm. And I, you know, the inspiration also came from Dr. Atta. Mm. He had a clock, in, he would keep a huge clock in front of him all the time. And he'd say, oh, well, so many minutes are left mm. of our time. We knew we had to go sooner or later, mm. that we were not there for, for a long time. Mm. And that we had to avail that time to do something mm. new, to implement our programs. Mm. Because remember, I was not only the policy advisor, I was also implementing. Hmm. 
And it was and because people found it difficult to implement in mm -hmm. Pakistan. I didn't find it difficult to implement, mm -hmm. partly because of uh, my husband was a bureaucrat and the bureaucracy in Pakistan is very strong. If, you, if you're friends with, bureauc with the bureaucracy, yeah. you can implement anything within a short time. Mm -hmm. So I, I managed to do that and I wanted to make full use of that time. Mm -hmm. So I'm sorry I wasn't present. <laughs> I know that I wasn't. At your son's wedding. Mm. Um, how do you think we can combat the spread of fundamentalism in Pakistan? We need to promote education. And we need to promote science, rational thinking. We need to make sure that every child goes to school mm. and we need to make sure that they learn no, not only science, arts, you know, everything that other children all over the, you know, the world over learn. Dr. Naim, uh, before, before you leave, what does the future hold for Pakistan? I think Pakistan, you know, um, um, has, a, has a bright future. Mm. Um, it has a um, young population. Number one, its big advantage is the young population. And although... 54% Allah... of Pakistan's population yeah. is, is young. Is young, yes. Although they are not, you know, um, not all of them, hmm. or quite a lot of them, let's say a large number of them are not literate, but they are very aware. Hmm. They are aware and they are very bright. Hmm. And they can be used for the, you know, they can be made literate, they can be made, one can use them for, you know, if you have, uh, if there's a massive industrialization program, hmm. they can become a very productive force for Pakistan. So the future is bright? Yes, they are very creative, they are very innovative, you know, I've, I have tried out our young people and I'm very proud of them. Whenever, particularly the scientists, whenever I have, you know, gave them a task, they always fulfilled it. Hmm. So, Dr. Naim, before you leave, we have this really cute round we call What's on Your Mind? We have two questions. You have to pick one. Some of them may not be very easy choices for you, but nevertheless, you have to pick your least favorite. Uh, fundamentalism, free love. Fundamentalism. <laughs> really? <laughs> Fundamentalism, not religious fundamentalism. <laughs> no, oh, oh. no. <laughs> okay. Um, Chamcha Giri or Dande Ka Zor? Very difficult choices you have made. <laughs> difficult choices. I think Dande Ka Zor. Yes. <laughs> Science or Sufism? Both. Science. Science. Nirvana or neuroscience? I would go for neuroscience. Mother Teresa or Abdul Sattar Edhi? Mother Teresa. Yeah. Rock and roll or jazz? Jazz. Jazz. Um, Alu ka paratha or cheese toast? Cheese toast. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like you want to have one right now. Um, Hitler or Saddam Hussein? Saddam Hussein. <laughs> False eyelashes or hair extensions? False eyelashes? Yes. Or hair extensions? Yes. Uh, false eyelashes? <laughs> it's, it's innovation. Yeah. <laughs> Scientific I know. I know. in the beauty areas. <laughs> in the areas. Yeah, but difficult uh, uh, ones, yeah. Uh, I would rather have none. <laughs> yeah. Brains or mm. strength? Brains. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Nain. Thank you so much. Thank really you. enjoyed interviewing you. You're an inspiration to women in Pakistan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. See, my father believed that India belonged to Indians, regardless of race, religion, and color. Because our past is not as important as the future is. When God wants you to win lottery, he gives you intelligence. Do I get a fatwa? <laughs> <laughs>